Ever wonder what they did with the dead bodies after battles throughout history? Well, wonder no more. To begin with, it's noted that the ancient Greeks made an effort to respect the usual burial customs of the dead after a battle, and collecting the bodies of the fallen was not uncommon. Most ancient Greek societies also made efforts to bury their dead near the city they hailed from if the time allowed it, though for the sake of practicality, mass graves of the like were sometimes used instead. In this case, cenotaphs were sometimes erected near their home city in honor of the fallen. An exception to this are the Spartans, who often buried fallen soldiers on the battlefield that they were killed at. Also somewhat unique was that rather than stripping the dead of valuables, as per Spartan tradition, each fallen Spartan was buried with their weapons and armor, and their final resting place was marked by a simple tombstone with their name and an inscription that read, translated, in war. This was a special honor among the Spartans. If one were to die outside of battle, no such tombstone would be given, and the person would simply be buried in an unmarked grave. The one exception to that was if a woman died in childbirth, she too would be given the honor of a tombstone. As for the Romans, most soldiers paid a small stipend each month to pay for funeral expenses should they fall in battle. As you might expect from this, the Romans made a conscious effort to recover the bodies of those who died and, if time allowed it, would bury or cremate them individually. If this wasn't possible, the bodies of the soldiers killed in battle would be collected and given a mass cremation or burial. In the event the bodies couldn't be recovered, a cenotaph would be erected to serve as a monument to the individual. The same cannot be said of later wars where there seems to have been an almost callous disregard for the fallen, and looting of the dead and dying was commonplace. For example, the Bayou Tapestry depicting the Battle of Hastings in 1066 shows soldiers piling up the bodies of the dead and stripping them of their valuables. It's believed that following this, the bodies were quickly cremated or buried in nearby mass graves. Looking at much better documented times, looting of the dead was also extraordinarily common during the extremely deadly Napoleonic Wars, with soldiers and locals alike pilfering what they could find after battles. For example, consider this account from a British general following the Battle of Halesburg in 1807. The ground between the wood and the Russian batteries, about a quarter of a mile, was a sheet of naked human bodies, which friends and foes had during the night mutually stripped, although numbers of these bodies still retained consciousness of their situation. It was a sight that the eye loathed, but from which it could not remove. For another first-hand account, we have that of French soldier Jean-Baptiste de Marbeau. Stretched on the snow among the piles of the dead and dying, unable to move in any way, I gradually and without pain lost consciousness. I judged that my swoon lasted four hours, and when I came to my senses, I found myself in this horrible position. I was completely naked, having nothing on but my hat and my right boot. A man of the transport corpse, thinking me dead, has stripped me in the usual fashion, and wishing to pull off the only boot that remained was dragging me by one leg with his foot against my body. The jerk which the man gave me no doubt had restored me to my senses. I succeeded in sitting up and spitting out the clots of blood from my throat. The shock caused by the wind of the ball had produced such an extravasation of blood that my face, shoulders, and chest were black, while the rest of my body was stained red by the blood from my wound. My hat and my hair were full of blood-stained snow, and as I rolled my haggard eyes, I must have been horrible to see. Anyhow, the transport man looked the other way and went off with my property without my being able to say a single word to him. So utterly prostrate was I. After being stripped of their belongings, the dead, and occasionally still barely living, would often be buried in mass graves, sometimes with bodies from both sides unceremoniously thrown in. However, there are accounts of battles where thousands of bodies were simply left to the elements. For example, General Philippe de Segur states in 1812, after passing the Cologa, we marched on, absorbed in thought, when some of us, raising our eyes, uttered a cry of horror. Each one instantly looked about him, and there lay stretched before us, plain trampled bare, and devastated all the trees cut down within a few feet from the surface, and farther off craggy hills, the highest of which appeared misshapen, and bore a striking resemblance to an extinguished volcano. The ground around us was everywhere covered with fragments of helmets and cuirasses, with broken drums, gun stocks, tatters, and uniforms, and standards dyed with blood. On this desolate spot lay 30,000 half-devoured corpses. It should also be noted that beyond any possessions the bodies had on them before being stripped, the bodies themselves were also of high value. For example, human scavengers would come through and rob the dead of their teeth, which would then be used to make dentures. Even more grimly, the bones of the dead of some of these battles were later collected and pulverized into fertilizer, which was sold for a modest price across Europe. To quote an article from The Observer written in 1822, 
It is now ascertained beyond a doubt by actual experiment on an extensive scale that a dead soldier is a most valuable article of commerce, and for aught known to the contrary, the good farmers of Yorkshire are, in great measure, indebted to the bones of their children for their daily bread. It is certainly a singular fact that Great Britain should have sent out such multitudes of soldiers to fight the battles of this country upon the continent of Europe, and should then import their bones as an article of commerce to fatten her soil. Moving across the pond and slightly more recently in history, markedly more respect was shown for the dead during the American Civil War, where teams of soldiers were tasked with burying the dead of both sides in simple mass graves, with great care being taken to ensure most soldiers received a proper burial. Finally, to discuss World War I and World War II, individual units were largely responsible for the disposal of their own dead, with both Axis and Allied forces having their own rules for how this should be handled. For example, during World War II, Colonel Walther Sontag of the Wehrmacht's Casualty Office issued a comprehensive guide for military graves officers detailing how mass graves should be constructed. Amongst other things, the guidelines indicated that mass graves should be made as close to railway lines as possible and feature pathways with the intention being that they'd eventually be turned into war cemeteries. As the war raged on, these guidelines were largely ignored for the sake of practicality. As for the Allies, during World War II, burying the dead largely fell to individual soldiers, but some units dedicated to the task did exist. For example, the United States Quartermaster's Graves Registration Service. Tasked with finding and burying every American soldier, the Quartermaster Graves Registration Service have been hailed as some of the unsung heroes of the war due to the general lack of recognition they've received since it ended.